More than 250 experts in the traffic signals industry join together in person to hear a range of papers here in Nottingham. These recordings are brought to you by AGD Systems, Colas, SRL Traffic Systems, Smart Video and Sensing, Vivacity and Unix Traffic. Thank you for having us, and uh, it's really good to be here. I did a, I did a presentation last year, um, but it was virtual. So it's nice to be here in person, a little more intimidating, but um, good all the same. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be up first, um, and then Chris is gonna follow, um, and we're gonna just talk a little bit about how we're getting more and more out of our bus priority system in London, um, and just wanna share some of the projects we're looking at, really. It's not. Clicking on again. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, right, okay, so I'm not going to read all the numbers out because um, it's there for you to see. And, and this is a very similar slide to what I started last year's presentation with. Uh, but there's just a quick reminder of a few odds and ends about some stats on, on our bus network. In addition to what you see there, uh, there are around 1,900 signals in London that operate with bus priority, uh, and there are about 6,000 virtual detection points, so the points where we actually can see the buses. Um, unfortunately, we do still have hardware limitations in terms of deploying more bus priority on the system, so we're not growing that network anymore in terms of hardware. So we're looking at clever ways that we can uh, see more buses and give more priority. And the challenge does remain. We still are looking at ways to try and improve journey times, improve the passenger experience, and ultimately get more revenue back into TfL uh, for people traveling on the buses. Um, last year, as you can see there, David and I did the, a joint presentation on some of the innovative things that we were doing. And this year, Chris and I are going to talk about, in a sense, probably a more data-led way of how we're trying to do this now. So before we dive in, to the different projects, I just want to share with you some statistics uh, that we draw off the system roughly on about a quarterly basis, and we started doing this back in 2018 when Andy said to me, um, Mike, how much bus priority have we got going on on the network, and we weren't really able to say. So uh, Chris actually developed a methodology for this, and we thought it was a good idea, so we've carried on running it uh, about quarterly. Um, and you can see there, so the graph on the left-hand side, the, the first one, that shows you purely the number of buses that we see on UTC per day. Um, the graph in the middle is a breakdown by bus priority type of the uh, bus priority that we give. So that's central extensions, local extensions, and recalls. And, uh, and this is where I can tell Andy that I'm doing a good job because we're constantly seeing more buses. We're constantly giving more bus priority. So the work that we're doing in our time reviews and some of the exploratory work that we're presenting today is working because those graphs are going up. The uh, pie graph on the right-hand side um, shows you, in essence, what a bus will experience as it approaches the traffic lights in London. So, uh, in all, about two-thirds of buses in London, when they approach signals, will go through on green or get some form of priority. And I think that's quite a powerful thing. That's quite a nice thing. Don't, don't come down to London and, and give it the test. That's just what the data tells us. Um, but next time you're on a bus, you can make your own observations, I guess. Okay, so the first project that I just want to talk about are the bus priority optimization reviews that we're doing. Now, I did present on this last year, uh, just about the concept of what we were about to embark upon. Um, we then did do 10 of these bus priority reviews. We were, they were very successful. So we added uh, another 33 to the time review program, which delivered some really good benefits last year. Um, so much so that we've now got 50 bus priority optimization reviews on the time review program for this year. Um, the key thing that we've done differently in terms of our site selection is whereas previously we just used scoot data to identify where certain junctions might be um, in need of a, of a review, what we learned from the pilot was that just using scape, scoot data alone wasn't enough. We were going to some junctions that were very low in terms of bus priority activity, and we got there, and frankly, they were very low because there were very few buses going through them. So it was limited in our scope of how we could improve the bus priority there. So what we did was we, we took the scoot data, and we've cross-referenced it this year with the actual number of buses that travel through a junction. Uh, and what the graph essentially shows you is, is a kind of operating threshold of a junction. Something, for example, which has lots and lots of buses, 
but isn't giving very much bus priority suggests that we maybe need to go and look at it. And that's illustrated by uh, the area marked in kind of section A. And in section B, um, where we've got not very many buses, but the junction spending lots and lots of time in what we term override, it's not running scoot, that means that we maybe should go and have a look at those as well. So by combining those data sets, we've been able to target our resource a bit more intelligently. So we are doing those uh, literally as we, as we speak. I'm sure some of the team should be doing, doing that uh, this week. Uh, the second uh, project that I just want to share with you is about our review of de virtual detection points. So the virtual detection point is the point in which we detect the bus on the approach to the junction. They have what we term as two stop conditions. So a bus is either in free flow um, as it approaches the stop line, that's stop condition two, or a bus is going to be approaching the stop line and it has to stop on the way, um, and that's stop condition two. Sorry, the free flow is stop condition zero. Um, so, so what we did was we wanted to analyze all the stop condition zero points, so the free flow bus journey times, and say, well, what are the journey times and are they enough to grant priority? To get central and local extensions, there's essentially a window of opportunity as a bus approaches the signals. And the, the likelihood of priority occurring is a function of that journey time. So the longer we can make the journey time, in essence, the bigger the window for centrals and locals. So we, we took the data sets, we looked at free flow stop condition zero points, we cross-referenced that where there are low bus journey times, and we came up with, there are 11 sites we did a pilot on, and by moving the virtual detection points at those 11 sites, we were able to increase extensions by just over 50%, which was a really good result. So again, I, I showed Andy this, and he said, brilliant, go away and do some more. So we're reviewing at the moment uh, 156 virtual de detection points that fall in that category. And uh, this, this uh, little animation here just shows you very basically all that we're doing. We are just reviewing where they are, not every point can be moved back. There are certain restrictions. There could be things coming out of side roads, buses turning out of side roads near stop lines, etc. cetera. Um, but that's a little project, and we're hopeful to move that on and get some more benefits. Uh, the third project I'm gonna, gonna share with you uh, is also about looking at virtual detection points, but this time looking at the distance that they are from the stop line, and then comparing that with the relationship that we have in terms of the data that we hold on our system from the bus journey time. Now, I've already mentioned why the bus journey time is important. Not only does it give us that window for priority to occur, especially with extensions, but also if you have an inaccurate journey time, um, you may be granting priority in the system, the bus is clearing through, but on street the bus may not actually be clearing through. So we've got to make sure our bus journey times are important. Um, and what we wanted to do was basically plot the distance from stop line that a virtual detection point was with the bus journey time, and you'd expect a fairly positive relationship as the distance from stop line of that VDP goes up, you'd expect your bus journey time to go up as well. And there's a fairly good cluster around where you'd, you kind of want to see the data, um, but I'm just going to highlight, and I want you to focus in on that kind of red bar. That red bar represents all the, uh, the links that we have with a bus journey time of 10 seconds, but you'll see that some of them are very, very close to the stop line, and some of them go all the way up, I think, above 140 meters from the stop line. So there's a huge variance in uh, the links that we have with a bus journey time of 10. That suggests to me that not our journey times aren't necessarily in great shape. So we've used this data, and again, in the time reviews that we're doing, we're highlighting this to the network managers, encouraging them to go out and uh, review the bus journey times to make sure uh, that we're giving more priority and getting the right type of priority. Um, just as a direct result of this, um, one of the bus routes that we've reviewed this year, Route 63, we found there were 32 bus journey times that could do with a bit of a look at, and we've remeasured those and got them up to scratch. Uh, the fourth project I want to share with you before I hand over to Chris is something that we've done recently about local extensions. Um, the keen-eyed among you on, on the, uh, the slide I showed with the graphs may have seen that our local extensions actually were in a bit of state of decline. And between 2018, when we started recording data down to 2020, uh, there was about a 20% reduction in local extensions. We didn't tell people to stop using local extensions when they were doing their reviews, so I wanted to really understand why this was the case. So I did a bit of engagement across the department, try and ga gain some opinions. And essentially, people just weren't using local extensions because they weren't very confident with them, and they didn't really understand them. Um, so I said, okay, great, let's understand them. Let's see if we should be using them more. So we had a bit of a, 
we had a bit of a multi-prong approach on how we can try and arrest the slide of decreasing local extensions. The first was a bit of a project that I undertook with a colleague where we really went into the, the detail of local extensions, more so than we'd ever done before, I think, really understood how they worked, what impact they had, and how we could influence them. And the result of that was, yes, we should be using them, essentially. So we took that. We then explored whether we could have local extensions with differential bus priority. So differential bus priority is just applying priority to buses that are late. Uh, previously, we'd been advised not to use locals with differential. We experimented with this. We actually thought, do you know what? This is a good idea. So we've started now allowing people and recommending them to um, use local extensions at differential bus priority sites. And there's about two to 300 sites in London that run differential bus priority that now can run locals. So that's quite a large number. The next thing, uh, and I, I always say we did, Chris, who's going to present you, did this particular piece of work. Um, he created or updated an existing local extension calculator. What does that do? It's basically a tool that the network managers can use to plug in the numbers that they understand to get the numbers out that we need to put in controlled specifications for local extensions. So it, generate, it auto generates timers, basically, uh, which, again, people were not putting these figures in control specs because they didn't really know what to do. Um, and then the last thing we did, we did, a, we did a wholesale review, we did a big download of data of all the local extension timers on the system, and we compared those local extension timers to our, our bus priority uh, journey times that we had in Scoot, and really the two should match up, but invariably the data sets didn't match up, and that highlighted to us that, again, our local extension timers aren't in great shape, and again, during the review process now, uh, we've encouraged people to go out and update them. To try and embed this in kind of the department, we did lots and lots of staff training. We did multiple courses. Chris delivered one, the local extension tool, um, to really get people up to speed, increase their confidence, upskill them, and encourage them to use them. And um, April 2021, that shows you an upkick in the amount of locals we've had. So we're, we're moving in the right direction. And we actually just did a download of bus priority data in August. So it was, it was too late to make the slide cut off, unfortunately, so I couldn't update the numbers. But um, the August data shows were up on local extensions by to the tune of about 2,500 again on top of the April figures. So that, that increase is continuing, I'm pleased to say. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass over to Chris now for a specific project that he, um, that he led on and delivered. So over to you, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name's Chris. I work with Michael. I do an awful lot of the data crunching, number messing around, that kind of thing. Uh, and so I am going to uh, talk about a particular piece of work we're doing um, where we're looking at a data source where perhaps it's been neglected in the past. Uh, this is to do with the configuration files that reside within the IBUS uh, units within uh, controllers. Uh, these uh, are in each one of the 1800 bus priority uh, sites that we have uh, across London. Uh, and the data within those effectively tells the controllers how to detect buses and which buses in particular they should be detecting. The data there uh, can be split into four different categories. We have junction data, which is the geographical information about the uh, junction in hand. We also have the information about the virtual detection points, the GPS locations of uh, where buses are picked up. Uh, we have movement data, which are the uh, specific movements that any bus traversing the junction can make. And we also have route assignment data. And this is perhaps the most important one. This is where we assign individual buses uh, to uh, the movements. So we have to say for each individual bus which movement it is on. Now, typically, uh, these are all uh, in, uh, added to the controller at the point of the installation of the bus unit. Um, so uh, when, when we're updating them, it tends to be on a bit of an ad hoc basis. Um, not a lot of people actually even know they exist, which is a bit of a problem. Uh, so um, there's an awful lot of different uh, data sources which can come in. Um, so th things such as the uh, information from UTC and Scoot, as well as current and historical bus data, that you all need to have a bit of an idea about how it all fits in before you can make an update. 
And um, the scale of uh, the updates required just from one single bus route being changed can be quite large. So say you have an old route on this red line and it is diverted to this green line, then you would have these red uh, circled sites uh, where the route would have to be removed. As you'd expect, you'd also have these green ones where you'd have to add that route on, into the controller. And you also have these um, kind of orange uh, loops uh, where although you won't be adding or removing the bus route, you will have to change the movement on which those uh, buses reside. So it would be a very arduous task to go through each one of the 1800 uh, configs manually and check each individual bus route uh, to see uh, whether they need to be updated or not. So I developed a tool uh, using existing data sets, uh, in particular geospatial uh, data sets to do with the uh, signals which are bus priority enabled, as well as buses from our busnet system, which our colleagues in buses uh, regularly update whenever there is a change to a bus route. So we plotted uh, the site where we have bus priority enabled using a centre point and then drew a 30 metre buffer around uh, each site. And then we plotted uh, each bus route and we checked when there was an intercept point. Uh, we did that for multiple routes and then we were able to take individual sites take a look at the controller information uh, residing within those sites and then say yes, say the 381 uh, is in there, but the 35 is not. So from this, uh, we collated everything together for every single junction and every single bus route and put it into a simple to understand output tracker spreadsheet. This spreadsheet uh, contains uh, site references which our network managers can filter down so that they can see the ones that they are particularly interested in. Uh, and it gives them assurance of the bus routes which are correct, the ones which are actually in the config file. But more importantly, it will tell them which bus routes have been picked up by the GIS data but haven't been uh, found in the controller uh, data. And so those ones need to be updated. So as a bit of case study, uh, one particular junction uh, just to the south of uh, Blackfriars Bridge uh, where the bus route 40 uh, was found not to be in the controller. This is because back in 2019 the bus route was moved. It used to terminate in Oldgate and now terminates in Clerkenwell. And now this, route, uh, this junction is on the line of route. So um, to change this, we just had to go into our fault management system and update the list for the uh, particular detector, two minute job. And then that is sent out on roughly a fortnightly basis to all of the controllers uh, just to give them a, a, a refresh. And the figures we got from this were very good. Um, uh, in terms of the number of buses detected per hour at this site, it almost doubled from 18 to 31. But in terms of the amount of bus priority given, it more than doubled. Uh, perhaps this is because it's quite a busy bus route and quite a frequent bus route. And so since this has been introduced in March 2021, uh, we've added nearly 150 uh, junctions and um, yeah, uh, 250 bus routes have been added to these uh, junctions, meaning that we're seeing roughly 4,000 more bus priority events every single day. And this will increase as this is integrated into our wider work streams. Okay, uh, I'll hand back to Michael. Thank you, Chris. So just, uh, just by brief way of conclusion, could you flick it on one, Chris, is that all right? The slide. Thank you. Thanks. I'm just going to load all these up and let you let you digest them. I mean, ultimately, the I think the concluding point that I just want to get across is that we, we do have continual targets to hit annually uh, with our time review program. And without increasing our, our physical bus priority real estate, we're still looking at innovative ways to try and get more bus priority out of the system. And, and the first thing we can do, certainly as, as Chris has highlighted, is seeing more buses. It's the first thing we need to do. So we are using data more and more now uh, in clever ways to try and increase the bus priority that we're giving. 
This is a low cost way to improve things, so not scheme heavy, not cost heavy, and ultimately we're just getting more value out of the existing uh, equipment we have. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, gents. Um, I was going to ask a question about uh, what's the impact on other modes of transport, but re say cars, but really the thing is moving people, and a bus moves more people, so, and that's obviously what you're focusing on, and squeezing more out of the available assets. That's really impressive. Um, we've got time maybe for one question. If you've got anything more burning or pressing, then um, I'm sure they'll be happy to talk to you later. Uh, okay, we've got time for a couple. I can see, I see Chris off there from uh, Via East Midlands. How's that? Yep. Chris Goff from Via East Midlands. We've been in, installed in across Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, Bus Priority Central uh, System with uh, D2N2 funding. Um, I'm just wondering how often you would expect to review junction performance um, per year on like a rolling programme. Uh, and the other thing is, I like the way you've only got sort of one uh, provider of public transport, whereas we're integrating with five, six, seven different operators, different routes and different systems. Um, so we've got sort of an exponential challenge of looking after those routes and how they change. I feel like a bit of a gunslinger because I'm getting ready to turn the mic on whether it was me or you, Chris. Um, in terms of timer reviews, so we, we have an annual programme for timer reviews. Um, we probably review signals once every three to four years on a, on a rolling cycle. Um, but it, it ultimately does just depend if, if you review a signal and then the scheme goes in, we then review again. Um, but we are using data increasingly rather than just a dart on a map of London, where should we review next? You know, the bus priority re optimization reviews I mentioned, that's, that's totally da data targeted. Um, so we're trying to be clever with how we approach it because it can take a few years to get around and look at everything. Um, just on your follow-up point, uh, there are multiple operators in London that we have to deal with. Um, I mean, Chris knows them all better than I, but there's over 12, or how, how many would you say? They're ranging from some that own tiny little routes out in the suburbs to, to the, the big groups that people have heard of, like Arriva and Stagecoach. Um, so there are lots of different operators that we deal with, but um, I'm not sure about all the background about all the bus priority system. I know how the scoot element works, uh, but they are all dialed into the same system. Okay, uh, was there one more up there? Hello, um, Chris Small from Transport for Greater Manchester. Um, I, I had a question about the um, bus journey time, because that's been a bit of a pain for us, that if you've got a lot of variability, it's hard to get it right. You either have it too small and you get cut off, or too long and you're holding them on green too longer. Have you ever did any look with cancel detection at stop lines? Because we've tried doing that, and it's been a pain and not work, basically, because they were getting cut off when, when they get to the stop line, and it would have recalled it, but it thinks it's past it. And, so I was just wondering whether you, to try and get rid of the journey time problem. Yeah, so, so we, do, we, have, we do have that facility, the cancel detection facility. Um, it was experimented with, it was proven that it does work, but ultimately you need enough virtual detection points to be able to cancel. New VDPs often need new proms, not, not always, not necessarily. Um, in truth, the benefit that we found from the study wasn't enough for them to put a load of energy into rolling it out wider. And, and it's not something we're actively pursuing at the moment. We're, we're still, I mean, as this presentation shows, we're not managing the existing data that we've got, and we've got 6,000 virtual detection points. If we start adding cancel detection, secondary detection points, which would help, you're right, it, we're just going to be kind of overwhelmed in a sense. Um, where we do have larger variability in journey time, I mean, we're, we're kind of in control of where we put the VDPs and therefore in control of what the journey times are. So we tend to recommend a, a journey time of between 8 and 10 seconds, kind of maximum in a sense. So the variability is then minimised. And it's never an exact science, as you say, but if we can minimise the variability, and then you can put it in whether you want it a bit higher or a bit lower, depending on driver behaviour, etc. So, yeah, it's something we've, we're aware of, and there's no magic kind of one that we've got to solve it. Thank you. Thanks. 
Okay, folks, we'll call a halt on the questions there. So thank you very much, gents. That was uh, really quite enlightening.